Roxy said, this is um, our final presentation of the session, and it is going to be our expert Q&A on zero waste with Angela Moore. And we're so, so pleased to have Angela here. She is a lead AP with a specialty in operations and maintenance, a true advisor and sustainability coordinator. And at the Missouri Historical Society, Angela oversees all the sustainable operations. Oh, and I have just lost my, my notes. Excuse me one moment. went into full screen without my permission. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so the Missouri Historical Society includes the Missouri History Museum, Library and Research Center, and Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Sustainable operations include green building certifications, such as LEED, TRUE, and Green Dining certification for the restaurant located at the Missouri History Museum. It also includes community and employee engagement centered around environmental sustainability practices within the St. Louis community. The sustainability department consists of herself and a sustainability intern, Victoria Coleman. And Victoria helps with employee and community engagement and Angela works solely on green building certifications. Um, so just as a reminder, Angela will, will speak about her work, but the majority of this session will be an opportunity for all of us to ask everything we've ever wanted to know about achieving zero waste. So again, please use the Q&A function and not the chat box to ensure that we see your questions. So Angela, we're so pleased to have you here and thank you again. And we would love it if you just shared a bit about your background um, or anything that you want to start with to get, so that we can then jump into the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Kate. I'm so sorry that you lost your introduction. I think that happened when I started to share my screen. Um, but as Kate mentioned, my name is Angela Moore. I oversee all of sustainable initiatives here at the Missouri Historical Society. Um, one of the most popular initiatives that I have been talking about for the past year has been zero waste. Um, but um, one thing is that um, the Missouri Historical Society, um, as Kate mentioned, is comprised of the Missouri History Museum, Soldiers Memorial Military Museum, and the Library and Research Center. Soldiers Memorial Military Museum is the first museum in the United States that have reached zero waste um, and have achieved a true zero waste certification. The Library and Research Center is the next uh, building that I will be um, leading towards zero waste. I'm quite excited. And the Missouri History Museum is a museum that um, more than likely I will not be going for zero waste, but the uh, gift shop and the restaurant all have um, certifications that focus on that. So a lot of people have, this is a term that's quite confusing. <laughs> and zero waste, when people think about it, that means that they're not generating any waste whatsoever. And that's not the case. Um, um, it is a waste practice that allows an organization to divert 90% of waste away from the landfill by means of recycling, reuse, reduction, repurpose, repair, redesign, and re-earthing, which we won't really get into re-earthing because that's composting and it's, this one is centered around conservation. And they also utilize circular economies um, to get to zero waste. And so I just wanted to um, give my information for um, anyone who, um, have added questions after this presentation. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for um, explaining briefly about what zero waste means. Um, and at your institutions, you define it in the same way. Um, so it means that you're diverting um, ninety percent of your waste, but then about ten percent of your waste is still going to landfill. Can you just clarify that? Yes. Yeah, so if you if you look at the uh, definition of zero waste um, from Zawiya, Zawiya is the Zero Waste International Alliance. Um, they define zero waste as the conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse and recovery of products, packaging, materials without burning and with no discharges into the land, water, air that threaten the environment or human health. 
And so at the Missouri Historical Society, um, not only do we follow Zawiya standpoint of zero waste, we also follow TRUE um, standpoint of zero waste. And TRUE is the acronym for Total Resource Use and Efficiency. And that's a zero waste certification that any site can go for um, to be zero waste certified. Um, but you do not have to go for a zero waste certification to practice zero waste. We at our organization usually go for green building certifications for transparency reasons. Thank you, Angela. So what motivated the Missouri Historical Society to pursue zero waste um, and the other sustainability initiatives that you have at these institutions? Was the idea brought up internally um, or were external factors also part of what drove that decision, i.e. E e were there um, subsidies from the city or the state? Can you just talk a little bit about how the process got started? So zero waste came about actually as an afterthought. Um, a lot of our buildings focus on LEAD, which is the acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So LEAD is also a green building certification that covers energy, water, waste, indoor air quality, and um, transportation. And when we were going for the LEAD process for Soldiers Memorial Military Museum, we had a really high diversion rate. Um, and it was close to 90% during that construction phase. And so that's when it was my aha moment because I said, okay, we can carry this out into operations as well. And so um, I collaborate quite a bit um, with my managing director. I report to a managing director. And um, when it comes to larger scale projects, such as capital projects or projects that will last over a long period of time, which is this zero waste project lasted two years, um, we kind of collaborate and we talk about it. And um, one of the things that came up when I was talking to her about uh, this particular certification was um, an environmental report that came out for St. Louis region. And it was an environmental racial report that came out and it highlighted eight areas that African American communities were greatly impacted, um, more so than other communities in St. Louis. And one of them talked about illegal trash dumping and handling of toxic waste um, from larger organizations. And so the true program came about that way as well. It was more of wanting to be more socially responsible and making sure as an organization, we wanted to support this um, environmental racial report. And so we pursued that certification that addressed um, illegal trash dumping and handling of toxic waste for larger um, organizations in the St. Louis area. And we're, we're one of the larger cultural organizations in St. Louis. That makes a lot of sense and that um, that reminds me too that in cultural institutions, the community that you know is surrounding you and that really the institution serves is so, so important. And so that's a really nice way to make that connection to your community. Mm -hmm. How do you convey the museum's sustainable initiatives to your audience? Um. We do that in multiple ways. So on our website, um, there is clearly a tab for sustainability. So there's a whole uh, page just dedicated all to sustainability. Um, I have gotten lots of community questions through our web page. So people ask a lot of questions of what we do for sustainability measures. If we have a large event, they're asking, how are you handling waste here? And so that is uh, one way. Another way that we do this is because we're one of the few museums um, that have such a strong sustainability program. I do write quite a few case studies that are available to all. Um, we try to do our best to share our experience and to share the blueprint. So with the lead and also with true, um, any organization can um, go on to any of those websites to see exactly um, how we got there. And so that's why we kind of pursue those green building certifications so that other organizations have a, a path and a blueprint to get there as well. 
And then, I'm sorry, Kate, then lastly, uh, we do have a curator of environmental life here. So um, he also curates um, exhibits that touch on climate change. One of them that's now being de-installed is the Mighty Mississippi. It talked about waste, plastic waste in the river. Um, and so we kind of talk about sustainability in multiple ways here at um, the Missouri Historical Society. That is incredibly wonderful. And it's incredibly wonderful that you're so generous with your knowledge in, in all of these different ways, including being here with us today. Can you, um, and this is a question from the audience, can you just talk a little bit about your own background, your education and professional experience and sort of how you got to this place? Okay, so um, my undergrad was in fine arts and um, I originally started off as an art historian. <laughs> and um, when I went to pursue my master's degree um, within my area, there was a museum studies uh, master's program and it was wonderful. But there also was a master's in public policy and administration that piqued my interest. And because um, museums were nonprofits and um, one other graduate student that uh, was in the program also worked at the art museum, she said, I think this will be the path for us to really take to make a difference. So I did that instead of pursuing a master's in museum studies, I pursued a master's in public policy administration with an emphasis on nonprofit um, management and leadership. But during my graduate um, assistantship, graduate research, and during the program, I, my studies were basically, and research was basically all surrounded um, for museums. Um, so that's kind of my background, and um, I have a few <laughs> certifications. I have a, a LEAD Applied Professional Certification, where I specialize in operation and maintenance um, of existing buildings. Um, museums are existing buildings, and then I'm a true uh, advisor, where I um, advise organizations how to become zero waste. That's a little bit of my educational background. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, and you, um, in your bio, you talk about how this is really just all of this work is is you and um, and your intern. Um, as museums think about achieving zero waste and other sustainability goals, um, who within the institutions or even outside of them? Um, really needs to buy in to make um, this work successful? Um, you know, what partners or communities or organizations do you recommend institutions really get to know or reach out to to um, achieve zero waste? So internally, your leadership team, um, fortunately, I was positioned in a, a good place where um, Starting my second year, I was promoted and I was assigned in a senior leadership team in operations. And um, who I report to is uh, the managing director of administration and operations, and she's in the executive leadership team. And so us together, partnering together, um, kind of makes a great impact on our leadership team. But if you're not positioned in where you are making those changes from a leadership level, um, you will need to have micro teams. So you'll have need to have micro teams in housekeeping, facilities, operations. Um, and those are actually the three key departments. Um, when I started the zero waste certification, I created a micro team in housekeeping. So I went to the director of facilities and said, hey, I have this opportunity. I would like to make this museum zero waste. It's never been done before, but I think that this would be a great opportunity. And I, I, and I think the housekeeping holds the key to this. And, and they did. Um, so for that um, certification at Soldiers, I partnered with two housekeepers and we went through a lot of training together. We did a lot of zero waste events around St. Louis. And so those are key. Externally, you wanna partner with organizations that have the same vision as you. Um, 
one of the organizations we partnered with for many years in St. Louis here, um, which was, was known as Recycling on the Go. They did large scale events where they taught the public how to recycle, what goes into recycling, what goes in composting and what goes in landfill. And so you wanna partner with those organizations. But then if you're actually going for a zero, if you're going for a zero waste certification, you need to partner with the US Green Building Council, your local chapter. They have so many free um, opportunities to green your building um, that's available to museums. That's, that's amazing. And um, it's really wonderful to hear too. And, and Kelly touched on this in her talk too, how important that relationship with facilities can be. Um, and is there, um, are there conservators or um, a conservation lab at your institution? Yes, so that is the next site that I will be uh, starting a certification. They started their certification actually this month. Wow. So yes, yeah, so the Library and Research Center is where the majority of our collection is. And so yes, we have a, a conservationist there, archives, we have librarian. Um, so, and it's a pretty large um, building. And I'll be working closely with them uh, over the next two years to make that site um, zero waste. That one it has more processes than the museum had, but uh, everyone is quite excited at that site. And I'm, I'm quite excited to lead them through that process. <laughs> Um, can you share with us any ideas that you have initially? I, I, I know that this process is just starting, but um, about how to minimize waste in conservation labs? So one of the first steps um, will be to find out where does waste originate? That is your first step. Um, where is it originating from? I think a lot of people think of it at the end point. Where is it going? Is it going to recycling or we put it in a lane field or we repairing it? Um, but when you have a zero waste approach, you need to figure out where is your points of generation. And so from a conservation standpoint, what is the vendor that you work with the most? And find out what products they're, they're giving you and reach out to them and say, do you have a buyback program? Do you have a take back program? Do you partner with another organization to recycle the materials that I have already used? Um, and once you do that, you get the conversation going. And I, I noticed from our experience here at the Missouri Historical Society, they wanna keep us, right, <laughs> as, a, as, as a vendor. And so they say, okay, we know that they're environmentally friendly. Um, we're gonna maybe partner with them with this. And they'll say, okay, we'll take these back and we'll recycle with this organization for you. And so um, then we do an extra step. If they say they're going to partner with us with another organization, we make sure what is the end market of that material. So once they take it back from us, where is it going? Um, and what is it being made into, recycled into, repurposed, upcycled to? So that's the first step um, for your conservation team is to um, identify points of generation. So the first step um, that I had for the Library Research Center this month was I handed out bins and I said, put everything, all of your waste in a bin. And it is waste that it is specialized for your field. So if the average person looked at it, they would not know what, what it was used for. And so I told everyone at the Library and Research Center, all departments, put all of your waste in the bin and we're gonna create a kit for every department and identify a vendor that is gonna take this waste for us, recycle it, repurpose it, upcycle it to get us to zero waste. That's so exciting. <laughs> um, yeah. And it really just, you know, like I think conservators also, we often think of our field as so small and so niche, but it really does show that the, maybe not necessarily us, but the institutions that we work for do have a lot of power and a lot of sway. And mm -hmm. we can really use that to have a positive impact if we just contact them. So I love that. I'm gonna try to do it myself. I think that's 
that's just really inspiring and, and yeah. exciting. You will be surprised, Kate, at how vendors change. We had a vendor that packaged all of our cleaning products in plastic baggies and just a simple call that said, hey, we, we really don't want to use plastic bags anymore. Can you just package our items in the box and we'll deal with the spillage that happens? And they did. And I later learned that they stopped that practice altogether. Um, from another organization. And so you can really make an impact just by a simple act. That's so inspiring. That's so wonderful to hear. And so this question, um, this next question is, is from the audience, but it does sort of touch a little bit upon this. Um, just what are some additional examples um, of waste disposal processes that have been revised um, to meet zero waste goals? So um, one thing I'll touch on is repairs. Um, I know a lot of organizations, they do repairs, but we really do repairs. So we partner with uh, other organizations for repairs. So if we have a vacuum that goes down, we partner for repairs. Um, and even smaller things that you wouldn't think that an organization should repair, we repair, such as furniture, we repair. Um, a little chair, if someone has an office chair that broke, instead of just throwing it out, we repair it. And so just um, that's one example. Another example is um, mop heads. I know that's a simple example, but um, we send those out to be laundered. We don't continuously buy mop heads. Um, another example that I know I'll touch on everyone is gloves. How do you recycle these gloves, right? And so we do two programs to recycle gloves. We do the Kimberly Clark uh, Right Cycle Program, where if we buy Kimberly Clark gloves, they'll take them back and recycle. But then we also do for those stray gloves that are left over, we do a TerraCycle box. And so we put all of those gloves in a TerraCycle box to um, recycle those. But the one way that we do uh, address it, as I mentioned before, is we just refuse it. We don't, we don't add products that we don't need. So we really keep a tight eye on what we acquire. And then that lessens what you have to do on the back end to recycle, reuse it, or repair it. That's, um, that's incredibly helpful and just amazing. And have you found that that has um, saved your institution a lot of money overall? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you will be surprised if you just go through the process of where your waste is being generated in, it then ends at facilities and they can say, oh, so you're telling us we don't need this large um, dumpster. And it's, no, you don't. You can actually, I know at the Missouri History Museum and our Library Research Center, we almost um, half the size of our dumpster. And it saved us thousands of dollars um, in one year. So imagine, I mean, we are institutions that are around for centuries. So you can just imagine how much that saves. If you're, if you're cutting operational costs, that means that those funds can be diverted to so many other means other than uh, waste. Yeah, that's incredible. And I love hearing more stories like that um, in one of the um, book clubs that Roxy and I host. Um, one of the attendees shared that they, um, I believe it was they, they did some facilities work to seal the envelope of the building a little bit better. Roxy, feel free to jump in and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they saved 300 jobs. So that money that you are saving in making these environmental changes can go toward you know, museum salaries, which I think we would all love. So um, it's just yeah. incredibly inspiring to hear that. Yeah. Um, I do have another um, conservation-based question. And I don't know if you and um, the conservation team there have thought about this yet, but we use a lot of very specific materials in conservation and that includes organic solvents and acids and, and bases. Um, do you have any plans to deal with the disposal of those materials? Yes, so um, that was the same case for Soldiers Memorial. There was a conservator at 
that location as well. And so we do, we work with local vendors. I see, and then for the zero waste certification, you have to log each chemical, um, how is it used, um, what container it came into, and how was it disposed of. And you have to keep those records on file for five to seven years. And so I do, I work with local vendors um, here in St. Louis to do a lot of the handling of those materials to make sure that at the end point, it's not going into the landfill or it's not being dumped into one of the lower social economic areas of St. Louis. So we have addressed that, but I think it'll be at a greater scale at the Library and Research Center because I'll be working with archives, <laughs> libraries, film, um, and so I'll be working with textiles, I would be working with all of those departments. Um, and so I think once I really get started on that library research center, um, it will be a very different case study than what I had with Soldiers Memorial because I'll have um, multiple departments that handle multiple different materials. Um, and so that's kind of how we have addressed it. And so our first step was to gather up all that unusual waste um, and then start to find vendors for that um, unusual waste. And, and I will say this, you will always find a vendor for it. I know in St. Louis, I know that we're not the, the biggest city in the United States, but if we can find you know vendors to handle that in St. Louis, I, I guarantee there are multiple uh, vendors um, in the United States and worldwide that will handle it. And that um, reminds me too, do you try to um, use local vendors um, exclusively? Always, <laughs> we try to use, do that always. We try to use local and minority vendors as much as we can. Um, so for the most part, yes. So for our cleaning products, yes, we use a local minority vendor. Um, for the cleaning products at Soldiers, we use a local um, woman-owned vendor. Um, so yes, and so the reason why is to increase circular economies within our region. Um, and so if we're addressing ways, but then now we're offsetting, you know, CO2s from what's coming in, it's almost like we're taken away from our goal of being less wasteful because now we're being wasteful in another resource. Right. So yes, we always try to strive for local. I think, I think that's so wonderful. Um, um, I forgot completely what I was going to say, but um, <laughs> we do have a few more questions. Um, and I guess I wanna to touch a little bit on um, on COVID um, and just in the past year and a half, you know, we've really seen an increase in single use disposable plastic um, materials in particular. How um, has the Missouri History Society addressed that? Um, and have you still been able to be zero waste during the pandemic? Oh yes, you can still be zero waste during a pandemic. You just have to understand what, what items are truly single use items. So if we look at masks, those are truly single use items, but how about providing visitors and staff with cloth masks? And so that's what we do, you know, um, since we had a mandate, but it's since been lifted that all visitors and staff are required to wear masks. We made sure that visitors knew you're able to purchase a mask in our gift shop. Um, and we offer that first before offering the disposable paper mask. For all staff, all staff was issued multiple um, cloth masks that they can launder and wear to work. And so that was the first option that we gave staff was to have cloth masks that they can launder. And when it came to cleaning products, we already were buying cleaning products in larger amounts, bulk amounts. And so we really did not have to alter that too much. Um, we continued to buy in larger bulk, or bulk amounts and through local vendors. And so you get less single wrapped plastics with different cleaners and uh, hand sanitizers. 
So we got the larger size hand sanitizers and we continuously refill staff tiny little pocket sanitizers. So that's just one way you can still uh, practice zero waste even during the pandemic. That's really wonderful to hear um, because it has been really disheartening to see so much disposable um, materials just increase. Um, and were you able to still do it at the restaurant as well? I think that's where I notice it the most is, you know, like a lot of places that maybe offered more reusable options have now really switched to, you know, a lot of sort of closed or wrapped plastic materials. Well, I know our restaurant fell to the consequences of a lot of restaurants uh, around the country. So our restaurant was not open at all during the pandemic. Um, but prior to the pandemic, um, they were a green dining alliance restaurant. So they had to follow all of the uh, regulations of a green dining restaurant in St. Louis. So they, prior to the pandemic, they did not offer um, disposable silverware, um, very few disposable containers. Um, and now that we are reopening um, later this month, it is still hold true they will be a Green Dining Alliance restaurant. And so they still will offer reusable silverware. Um, and it's a full service restaurant. So they have multiple dishwashers that they can use to sil reuse silverware for. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful to hear. Um, I have a question from the audience. Um, do you foresee a wider trend for museums establishing in-house sustainability officers? Um, and what will this mean for emerging professionals and professional development education within the cultural heritage sector? I do see it. Um, there's very few of us now. I've only met four of us and uh, two of them have been recruited away to cities. So I, I only know of two others who have sustainability in their title. And I do see it being a trend. And the reason why I say that is because museums have to start coming into line with uh, the external environment of what is happening outside of the sustainability world. And more and more of the public and communities, disadvantaged communities are demanding that larger organizations become more socially responsible. And sustainability is one of those issues you need to become socially responsible in. Um, and I do see it happening as well because um, from me being here for my short period of time of five years, I'm astounded at how much this institution has saved um, just by pursuing a LEED certification, just by pursuing TRUE. Um, they have saved thousands of dollars in areas that I did not even imagine that they would. Um, and so I do, I see more organizations uh, pursuing sustainability uh, coordinators. Um, and it does take a lot of training, I will have to say that. Um, although I've been in this role five years, I'm, I'm still learning um, about sustainability. And for museums it's quite unique because a lot of sustainability programs and training focus on offices. And we know museums are more than just office spaces, right? And so um, that's why I, I try to make as many case studies as I can and partner with the other two um, organizations that have sustainability officers. We do our best to try to share with other museums what we have learned um, for free. The information is open for all of us to get there. And so we do our best to try to say, okay, we're officers in this institution. This is our path that we have taken. This is our successes and these are our fails. So we have definitely shared quite a few, few fails. Um, and so I do see it being a trend and they will have to, museums will have to be a little more responsive in the area of climate change going forward. I love, um how you keep, you know, how you're so open and um, it, it's clear it's very important to you to share as much about sustainability as possible, which um, really reminds me of um, Catherine Hayhoe, 
um, belief that, you know, the more that we talk about sustainability, the more we can inspire others to do it. Um, and yeah. with that in mind, do you know if there are any plans for um, the conservators to publish or share anywhere this process as they go through zero waste? Because I think that could be incredibly helpful for our field. I'm going to actually post that to them and I think they will be quite open. Um, they're very excited to be the first library and conservation area, collections area to go zero waste. Yeah. Um, and I think that they will be quite open. I know that um, I have partnered with them quite a bit on indoor air quality. So I know that they, they will be more than happy and I know that I will help to create a case study with them. So I'm going to pose it to them when I, when I see them tomorrow and see how open they are to documenting the process. Maybe we'll do a video or a photo or a, it definitely will have a case study because it's a requirement for the certification. Oh, great. But um, I will see how we can catalog it and so that others can follow it step by step uh some way because <laughs> it's a long process it's a two-year process but i'll figure out how we can update and uh others on that process yeah that would be really amazing and i don't know if you can see the chats from roxy but she's very excited also <laughs> um and uh i guess the sustainability committee too in general you know like I don't know if we could interview you all or something. We can talk about that another time. Um, but it's really, it's incredibly exciting to hear and really wonderful. And I do have another um, conservation related question. I don't know if you're familiar with the materials, um, mylar, ethafoam, and velara. They're, they're other um, sort of conservation specific materials. Um, and a member of our audience has asked um, just about their, their disposal. Um, they're polyethylene foams. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Those have come up at our institution more than once. Um, I have tried to find ways to dispose of those. There's only one method that I have found. And we had what was called a recycling extravaganza here in St. Louis. And there was a company here in St. Louis that would take foam for you, like a large, large amounts of foam. I have since then have not been able to contact that vendor. And that was two years ago. Um, and so we have hung on to it until we can figure out what to do with it. Um, I even looked into buying one of the foam compactors where you would compact it into a smaller size. Um, but that equipment is just so astronomical and we need the space to install it. So um, that definitely will be one of materials. If the, if the um, question is, um, if someone can leave their email from who posts the question, once we address that at the library, I'll make sure I share how we address it, if that's possible, if they don't mind sharing that. Sure. Um, yeah, so if that, if, um, let's see if I can pull the question up again. Um, uh, but yes, if that person um, whose name maybe I won't say, but I do know who it is, um, wants to type in their email in the Q&A, um, only the panelists will see that and I, and we can make sure that Angela um, has that perfect, she has done it. Um, and um, if any other members of the community too are also curious to hear that, maybe we could share that information um, in other ways once we have it, because I know that um, that is really a question that comes up a lot for conservation. Um, and sort of piggybacking on that, actually, Roxy has asked what the conservators um, use for packing art, because often those materials are used for um, shipping out loans, et cetera. Do they? Um. I, I have to look. I know for a fact there's Tyler who's pictured, who was pictured on the right hand side of holding the chair. Um, in that processing area that they use, they, I don't know the exact material that they use, but they do have a shelving of all reusables. So 
they keep it. And even if it's just a tiny piece, they continue to pack it. Um, I Once I get over there and start listing and cataloging more, I, I can find that out. For Soldiers Memorial, they had very little packing. And where the storage was located in the undisclosed area was um, close to the museum. So I don't remember seeing any packing um, and very little styro styrofoam from that soldier's location. Um, so I'll have to look back to my catalog of waste for packing to see what they use and what we did with it. But I, I don't remember um, weighing that at all because <laughs> you have to measure all of your waste and I don't remember putting okay. that on the scale. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, it would be really interesting to, to hear about this, um, this process in, in some way because it's, it's fascinating. Um, and it sounds as if they are already sort of in a sustainability mindset and kind of thinking of a lot of creative ways to reuse materials already. So that's incredible. Oh yeah, they were there way before I got here. Okay. So in, in 2012, the staff had a green committee and they were implementing measurements way before I got here. When I got here, it became the point of, we need in a more innovative ways. We need data. We need you to look at statistical data. We need you to look at more funding for us to do more capital, bigger capital projects for energy, waste, water, native plants. So I came on as the, okay, we've done all the small things. Now we need somebody to look at our data, analyze our data, benchmark our data, um, and also funding, right, grants, and uh, to talk about the triple bottom line. So that's kind of where I came in at. But um, the curator of environmental life, he has been here over 15 years, I believe. So as you can tell, that dialogue was already happening um, internally. And my managing director of um, administration operations, she's been here 40 years. And so she was already having that dialogue. When we had an addition added on to this museum in 2000, she um, designed it for it to be a sustainable museum. So they already had this um, culture of sustainability here. And so when I came, I have to say, they were, they were looking for me as, okay, we've done all that we could physically do um, as staff and a committee we need now um, a dedicated staff person to take us a little further. So they already laid the path, uh, a nice path for me when I, before I came in. It sounds like a really special place. I hope that I get to, to visit one day. Um, <laughs> we have a comment from the audience um, that some museums are donating foam scraps to artists or for school um, projects. I don't know if that's something that, um, that you do in some form, maybe for other materials too? We do that for other materials. So um, as our institution is quite large. So we have a K through 12 education and then we have a youth and family education. So they have tons of uh, supplies for youth, for homeschool days. Um, so they do, they partner with the organization called Perennial here in St. Louis. And Perennial is a repurpose, reuse organization. And they create all kinds of things from objects that organizations donate. And then Perennial comes back into the museum and shows us how to use items that we have multiple of. So it's a, it's a nice relationship that we have. So yes, we do, we do quite a bit of donating um, from larger items to smaller items. That's really wonderful. I worked at institutions where we were not allowed to do that. Mm. And I don't know, I don't know if that is a New York City rule. Um, was it always the, the case um, that you were able to donate or did you have to 
to get like a special permission. I don't, I don't even know how it works, but I found it really frustrating and surprising that we, that we weren't able to make donations. We worked with our finance team. So to put a, a value to it, right? So we have to have a value to it in a process of letting it go. Um, but yes, as long as I've been here, we, we donate. Um, and the Library Research Center is now going through another compact shelving um, project. And all that old shelving that they have will be donated to a smaller, tinier museum here in St. Louis, an African-American, smaller African-American museum here in St. Louis. So now they get really nice shelving because we're upgrading to compact shelving. So yeah, we, we usually find ways to donate uh, items. Even during COVID, we gathered vast gloves donated to our local hospital. And um, we just always put a, a monetary value to it prior to donating. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and I feel like we've, we've sort of been touching on these ideas, but um, I think, you know, in our sort of general understanding of being sustainable, we talk a lot about um, recycling. And I think a lot of people don't realize that there's actually a hierarchy to, you know, the four R's or the five R's or how many R's people are using at the moment. Um, and that recycling is actually one of the last things that we want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about other ways that you, um, you know, refuse or reduce or, um, because you definitely touched on like repurposing and reusing the materials. Um, one of your first things is to redesign. <laughs> redesign how your um, organization is set up. Redesign it. Um, and it doesn't cost much, <laughs> but redesign it so that your landfill trash and your recycling trash are right next to each other. And you're going to educate. You're going to re-educate what goes into this landfill and what goes into recycling. Don't put your recycling all the way across the room and your landfill all the way across the room because most of the time the landfill is the one that most people gravitate for. So redesign um, is one way that you get to zero waste. You're gonna redesign how um, your organization looks at waste. And then you're going to um, repurpose. So look at things that you can repurpose. What we do most of the time is, is donate. Um, another area that um, we look at is reuse. Um, prior to COVID, we had a office swap every year. So every year there was an office swap and it was held at the History Museum and all buildings came. And I wish I could show a picture of the one that we had. And people just come and shop. They shop the organization. And so uh, that's one of the ways. But I'm glad that you, Kate, that you mentioned the recycling. And yes, recycling is right above, um, is the third one from the bottom. The very bottom is um, incineration, burning trash. And then second to the bottom is landfill. And then you have recycling. So recycling and landfill is right next to each other. But the other R's is you're gonna find reuse. And another one is refuse that I talked about. Refuse adding more things to your organization that you do not need, and then start to look at certain areas that have multi uses. So don't buy for a one use item, buy for a multi use item. And so that's one of the areas you can get to zero waste is um, change the way you think of things. Um, one way that I, I, I think of it is I, I grew up in a lower social economic <laughs> group. And it wasn't called sustainability and it wasn't called zero waste when I grew up. It was called not wasting. If you don't want it, don't take it. If you're not gonna use it, don't touch it. Don't even look at it. Um, and it was just, it's a, a mentality shift of just um, not, a, not a mentality of scarcity, but a mentality of just respect and honoring everything that went into that material from the energy, the water, um, manpower um, that went into that material. And so when you look at it from that standpoint, you say, okay, I don't really need it, so I'm not gonna take it. So that that's kind of the holistic approach to zero waste. That makes just so much sense. Um, 
and it reminds me too often of how you know in museums especially larger institutions you know some of the more well-known um ones you know everything really has to be new and sparkly and and um you know i keep thinking too about um new exhibitions that can use you know reused materials and do you is that something that you do as well yes yes and you know what's so funny the exhibits team was the first uh, team when I got here that was so excited <laughs> and they they are so good about um, reuse so when a de install is happening which a de install is happening right now we have contracted with um, a company called Leader um, in St. Louis and they recycle all of that construction de install material for us and then we have someone um, in the exhibits department that comes and deinstall all the um, all items that can be reused. And then they have a storeroom, and they have it so organized of items that need that can be reused on the next exhibit. And so I wish I had the other PowerPoint. We actually did a present exhibits team did a presentation on that. And they talked about an exhibit that we had recently, uh, Route 66. And they talked about how much we reused and repurposed in an exhibit. And uh, people were just astounded at how much we reused and repurposed in the exhibits to create the Route 66 exhibit, which was a few years back. But the exhibits team is great. They provide diversion rates for me. They'll say, this is the diversion rate we diverted away uh, this percentage, one time they diverted away 99%. So they were really close to 100%. And so, of course, I, I treated them with lots of chocolate and stainless steel straws. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that, is, that is so wonderful. I feel like I would just want to see like an exhibit on how all of this was done. Um, I should try to do a time-lapse video if they, if they will allow me. I think they will be quite open to that. That, yes, that would be, it would be incredible. Um, uh, Rocky C is mentioning to me that we're having a lot of um, interest in the comments about people um, wanting to know how the foam. Yes, how the foam I saw. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure you knew that. And I think, um, I think I could keep asking a million questions, but we're running a little bit low on time. So if anyone has any last minute questions that they want to try to sneak in? No? Okay. Well, Angela, I cannot thank you enough. This was so fascinating. And I just want to hear about everything. I'm sure Roxy and I will um, like be in touch and try to find additional ways that we can collaborate and amplify all this really wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for anyone, please reach out. As I mentioned before, this as an organization, we want more organizations to do what we're doing too. <laughs> and so reach out. Questions, comments, suggestions. I love to hear it all. Yes, I want to echo that. Thanks, Angela. I think maybe creating some kind of like how to make your lab zero waste would be a really fun collaboration. But anyway, we can talk about that offline. Um, but um, yeah, so thank you to Angela and Kate. And thank you, of course, to our other speakers as well, um, who are so wonderful. We're coming right up to two. So I'm just going to jump in because I also could probably talk to Angela all day. Um, but yes, we also wanted to thank our colleagues at AIC, Elena Gregg, who is our staff liaison, and um, Ruth Saylor for all of her work making this uh, meeting possible. Um, and yeah, so for anyone who has more questions, thoughts for Angela, obviously you can reach out to her or any of the other speakers, um, but also if you want to just email um, our sustainability committee directly, I've put the email in the chat. Um, so we'd love to hear about any kind of exciting initiatives that are going on around the field. You know, we, we know of what we've heard of, but we don't know of everything. So we would love to hear more and we'd love to highlight different um, people who are doing, you know, really interesting and innovative things. So if you do have any ideas or, um, you know, want to be featured, please let us know and we will, you know, reach out. We're about to expand our committee to 10 people, which is super exciting because that means um, we will have a lot more manpower to do these things. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, please have a great rest of your day. <laughs>